previously on Tales of the Hunger Games. In District 7, Cherry picked Junipero to be her district partner. Their mentor, Asher Seetle, was not particularly useful to Cherry, but did help Junipero to a degree. They both made an okay impression before the games. In District 6, Arizona picked Madison as his district partner, and their mentor, Capital Game Victor Irene Alfayed, spent most of the time before the games trying to convince them to work together in the arena. Once the games began, both pairs had some narrow escapes within the opening minutes, but the four of them made it to a relatively safe hiding place, although with hardly any supplies between them. The group banded together and hid in the J-Block, in the southern end of the Jansen complex that was closer to the southern studio. Despite a few squabbles here and there, the group were getting on well and supporting each other. But on the second morning, they were ambushed and forced to flee into the southern studio, where they were split into two different hiding places on the first floor of this building. Just as Madison and Junipero were about to be attacked by the careers, a loud scream was heard from the recording studio at the end of the corridor. The careers looked at each other with joy after hearing this sound, and without a second thought, they ran straight down the corridor and into the recording studio, before rummaging through the labyrinths of sound screens and recording equipment, with their knives at the ready, in search of the person who had screamed. Yet once the careers had entered the depths of this large room, they failed to notice Proton and Tweet, both from three, quietly exiting a cupboard by the entrance. Proton turned off the main power and light switches, whilst Tweet grabbed the keys from behind the door. The careers instantly shouted and asked which of them had turned the lights off, but as they began to fall over in the darkness, Paulus was able to run back to the entrance, and whilst Tweet rapidly tried to lock the door from the outside, Paulus pulled against it from the inside. However, Junipero had heard this commotion, and he opened the door very slightly to see Tweet and Proton pulling against the door with all their strength, in order to be able to lock it. He ran towards the door, and although Proton and Tweet looked scared that he was about to attack them, they held on to the door, and Junipero joined them in pulling it shut. He shouted for Madison to help, and she seemed slightly baffled by what she was witnessing, but as she ran to them, Junipero's additional strength appeared to be enough to close the door. Madison then helped Tweet to turn the key, and the door subsequently locked, whilst Paulus bashed against it from the inside and shouted to be let out. Viewers in Snow Square had been cheering with excitement throughout this scene, and Caesar stated that he had never seen anything like it throughout all his years of commentating. In fact, it had been shown that whilst the tributes from District 6 and 7 were hiding, Proton and Tweet, who were in the studio, heard the commotion and decided to use a pre-recorded screen that Tweet had made the day before with the rather advanced recording equipment, before hiding in the cupboard by the door. The plan had worked, but before Junipero or Madison could even talk to Tweet or Proton, Tweet grabbed the keys from the door and yelped with terror as she and Proton sprinted down the corridor from Junipero and Madison. As they looked on in disbelief, Caesar remarked that you don't see that every day. Junipero and Madison looked at each other in shock, and after hearing more and more of the careers banging against the door, Junipero suggested that they left as quickly as possible. They walked down the corridor, but just as they walked past the cupboard containing Arizona and Cherry, it opened and Junipero immediately jumped. However, when Cherry appeared, he seemed happy and helped her out, along with Arizona, whose leg was still in pain. The group quickly left the studio and ran to the E-block, where they rested for the remainder of the day. After an hour, three cannons sounded within a minute, which were revealed to belong to the careers, when Discordia suddenly turned upon her allies through the darkness. Although out of this group, only Aurus survived. As Junipero tended to Arizona's leg and removed the arrow for him, Arizona thanked Madison for helping him earlier. Junipero proceeded to have something to eat with Cherry, and they kept watch from outside apartment E8. Madison joked that seeing as Arizona had helped her during the bloodbath, they were now even with each other. Arizona proceeded to ask Madison about her life in District 6, and why she chose to waste her life in the Morphling Dens, to which she replied that she needed to do what she could after her parents had died, in order to support herself and her younger siblings, and that people should not assume that she enjoyed doing what she did. Arizona stated that he did not know that Madison had younger siblings, and she mournfully nodded, which seemed to make Arizona upset as well. As the sun set, they spoke more about their lives and various aspects of District 6, whilst apparently forgetting that only one of them even had a chance of making it back. The group once again slept and kept watch, and at midnight, the portraits of Mohair from 1, Paulus and Discordia from 2, and Jack from 8 were each shown in the sky, which left 14 tributes remaining. 
When the sun rose the next morning, Cherry awoke her allies to let them know that she could see Bill eyeing their building from the main road. Although fortunately, he had not seen Cherry through the window, and he decided to head down to the studio at the bottom of the complex instead. The group got up and they drank some water and ate some of the remaining bread. Arizona continued to keep watch from the window, and he asked Madison what she thought was their best plan of action, and she stated that it was probably best to remain in this apartment for as long as they could. Not a lot of action occurred in the arena until the mid-morning, when another announcement was made by gay Mika Fling. As the announcement began, Madison tiredly asked, what now? But she was quickly silenced by Junipero, who stated that they needed to listen. Fling then told the tributes that they should not be lazy bones, and that they had ten minutes to leave their current buildings, or they would risk being ripped into a pile of bones. Madison and Arizona looked back at Junipero with an eerie expression, but he quickly got their remaining bread together and knocked on the door of the bathroom, where Cherry was using the shower. She very quickly got changed again into her brown suit, and Arizona started to run down the stairs, although Cherry wisely warned him that there may be other tributes in this building. They therefore made their way carefully and slowly down the stairwell until they reached the front door. As he stood by the door, Junipero asked them if they were all ready to run to the next building, but Madison asked if they were allowed to enter another building, which triggered a pensive silence over the group, before Arizona said that they needed to get outside and see what was happening before they made a decision. The quartet quickly ran outside, and just as they stood upon the main road, they spotted Fructo and Barley, both from Nine, come out of the nearby H-block, and Fructo was armed with a knife. Although the crowds in Snow Square gasped and cheered for action as the two groups spotted each other, they each kept their distance, and simply remained by their buildings, seemingly not wishing to risk an attack against the rival group. A tense silence rested over this area, until Milka hurtled out of the neighbouring C-block, and she quietly edged away from the tributes of District 6 and 7, who remained still, even though Junipero appeared to be flinching as he watched Milka slowly walking back from them. Yet the silence was quickly broken by a rabid barking sound that came from the bottom of the road, and Cherry grabbed onto Junipero's hand once more. Madison whispered to Arizona that this sounded like a dog, and they noticed Barley gesturing to Fructo that they needed to run towards the mansion at the top of the road. But just as he was whispering something back to her, Auris and Bill suddenly appeared from around the side of the H-block, and they sprinted towards Barley and Fructo. The group from District 6 and 7 ran away and up towards the mansion, but neither Barley nor Fructo spotted Aurus and Bill until they were just metres from them. Barley saw Aurus from the corner of her eye, and she screamed, before starting to sprint up the road. Fructo panicked and ran, but within seconds he had tripped to the ground. Aurus quickly attacked Fructo with a knife, and whilst the quartet ran up the road after Milka, Bill shot an arrow from the crossbow, which hit Barley through the back of her head, and she fell to the ground. Within twenty seconds, the cannons of Barley and Fructo had sounded, quickly followed by a pack of six large Rottweiler hounds suddenly appearing at the bottom of the road. Aurus and Bill sprinted up the hill away from these dogs, towards the mansion, where almost all the other ten tributes had headed. The pair eventually made it into the hallway between the towers, and they slammed the door behind them, in order to stop the dogs from entering. But they proceeded to run along to some of the other entrances to the mansion, whilst barking extremely loudly. Meanwhile, the quartet was sprinting up the eastern stairwell. Milka was running slightly ahead of them, but they seemed less focused on attacking her, and more focused on escaping Aris and Bill. Cherry tripped, and appeared to hurt her ankle, and as the barking of one of the dogs was heard entering the stairwell below, Arizona quickly picked her up from the ground, and Madison said that they needed to run along the middle floor, whilst Milka continued up the stairwell to the top floor. The group ran along the corridor of one of the middle floors as the barking got nearer, although most of the doors that they tried to open were locked. Oasis from 4 ran into a room further ahead on their right, but he quickly locked the door after entering, as so they could not follow in after him. Madison and Cherry panicked as the barking rose through one stairwell, whilst the joyful shouts of Aris and Bill rose through the other, yet Arizona had been eyeing a rather elaborate vase that lay on a table by one of the doors. He grabbed it and smashed it against this door's handle. Cherry screamed as one of the Rottweilers appeared, but luckily for the group, the door's handle broke, and they hurried into the room. The group collapsed into this room, and they quickly realised that this was the main library at the back of the house, but Junipero quickly stated that they could not lock this door as the handle was broken. The dog started bashing against the door and barking loudly, which prompted Junipero to shove his foot in front of the door, 
In order to stop it from opening, Madison ran to the window, and she told the others that there was a greenhouse below that they could possibly escape to, although there was a drop of roughly ten feet onto its roof from the window of the library. However, just then, the barking and scratching against the library door suddenly stopped. Junipero seemed perplexed, and although Cherry seemed to think that it was safe to head back out of this door, Junipero quickly warned her that the safest exit would be from the window. She seemed hesitant, but just at that moment, an eerie voice shouted, Anyone in there? Outside the door, and Junipero whispered to the others that it was Bill. Whilst Junipero continued to hold on to the door, Arizona quickly opened the window and climbed through it, before wincing as he dropped down onto the glass roof of the greenhouse below. He held his breath as he stood completely still, as Snow Square became very quiet with anticipation as a creaking sound was heard from the glass. Arizona tried to slide across the glass roof without it breaking, and he quietly signalled for Madison to help Cherry towards him. But just as he managed to grab her hand, a banging started against the door, and Junipero said that he could not keep it shut for much longer. As Cherry started sliding across the glass towards the garden at the back of the mansion, a creaking was heard, but Arizona was too concerned with helping Madison to notice this sound. Yet just at that moment, Cherry let out a petrified squeal as two of the Rottweilers suddenly appeared in the greenhouse below, and they jumped up and barked at her. This made Madison flinch as well, which caused her to trip onto the glass, and her knee caused a large crack to form where it hit the glass. However, inside the building, Aris joined Bill in his efforts to force the library door open, and although Junipero was strong, his grip began to weaken. Cherry had just about made it to the edge of the greenhouse, whilst Arizona and Madison were still trying to slide across the centre, although due to their greater weights compared to Cherry, the glass was dubiously creaking beneath them, whilst the Rottweilers savagely gnashed the air below. It was at this point that Junipero decided to take action, and he suddenly stopped pushing against the door and sprinted across the room towards the window. The door swung open, and Bill and Aris almost fell to the floor due to the force that they had been exerting against the door. But they got up and charged after Junipero, who had now just made it to the open window. Madison, who had almost made it to the edge of the greenhouse's roof, shouted at Junipero to be careful, but he panicked as he stood in the window and saw Aris and Bill running through the room towards him, before jumping down onto the greenhouse's roof. Unfortunately for Junipero, the force of his larger weight was no match for the glass's fragility, and he smashed through the roof onto a flower bed below. Cherry screamed, but Madison and Arizona grabbed her, before jumping off the side of the greenhouse into the garden below, where they landed on a relatively soft bed of soil. Bill and Aris watched in anticipation from the window of the library, as Junipero got up from the flower bed, with thorns now lodged into skin all over his body. Cherry shouted for Junipero and ran to open the outside door to the greenhouse, but Madison pulled her back, and within a second, a Rottweiler jumped against this door, almost breaking it. Meanwhile, Junipero stood up, and the other Rottweiler ran towards him. It knocked him to the ground and tried to bite at his neck, but he was just about able to hold it back. Yet once the other Rottweiler realised that it could not attack Cherry through the glass, it ran back to Junipero, and as Madison spotted Aris pointing at them from the library window and talking to Bill, she pulled Cherry away with Arizona through the garden, whilst Junipero screamed in pain, and his cannon was heard shortly after. The group ran back around the side of the mansion and towards the B-block, which they quickly entered. Cherry sobbed as they made their way to the top floor of the building, and once they had entered apartment B-7, another cannon sounded, which was revealed to belong to Fern from Eleven. When she was escaping from the mansion, and accidentally ran into Bill and Aris. Madison tried to comfort Cherry, who was blaming herself for Junipero's death, and Arizona got her some water. Madison then said that Junipero would not blame Cherry, in the same way that she did not blame Arizona for her being there, and she gave him a knowing nod as she said this. Eugenia laughed, and asked Caesar if he thought that Madison was being truthful, to which Caesar replied that maybe she was just being very tactful, and that this was always the best part of the games, when the numbers were lower and the emotional warfare began. However, the group's fortunes turned, and that evening, a picnic was delivered to them by sponsors, which arrived by drone outside the window of apartment B7. No district number was written on the picnic, so all three tributes helped themselves, which appeared to lighten each of their moods to some degree, especially that of Cherry, who asked Madison to show her some more camouflaging skills, which she willingly obliged to. Cherry took the first watch from outside the apartment, 
whilst Madison and Arizona slept in the bedroom, and at midnight, the portraits of Junipero from seven, Barley and Fructo from nine, and Fern from eleven were shown in the sky, which left ten tributes remaining. It was noticed that when Junipero's portrait was shown, Cherry sobbed uncontrollably for several minutes, whilst continually saying that she was sorry. The next morning, Arizona, Madison and Cherry all seemed to be rather well rested from their sleep, and they spent the early morning eating from their picnic. After talking about life in District 7, Cherry was asked by Madison if she was any good with an axe, but Cherry grinned and shook her head. However, just as this conversation continued, Arizona mentioned that they might be asked to move again soon, and so they should pack their supplies for them to be ready to leave. The trio proceeded to pack their picnic away, and Madison looked out of the window, whilst Arizona and Cherry talked to each other about their lives before the games, but Madison claimed that she could not see anyone moving, and that anyone would think they were the only three left in the arena. They ate their midday meal around the large table of the living room, but just as they were finishing, a rumbling started from the ground below. Cherry was the first of this group to seem alarmed, and within seconds, the table was shaking about rather violently, and sounds of smashing and clattering could be heard coming from the other buildings. Arizona quickly threw himself under the table, and whilst Cherry sat there in terror, Madison grabbed her and pulled her under the table as well. Cherry screamed as the lights flickered, and several ceiling tiles came smashing down to the floor around them. A cannon was heard, and Madison held Cherry close to her under the table, whilst Arizona quickly reached up to grab his unfinished sandwich, before throwing himself back under the table, and although this made Madison look at him in disbelief, it made Caesar laugh during the replay. Screams were heard within the tremors from all around the arena, as well as another cannon, and the lights in this living room crashed to the floor. Cherry continued to hold on tightly to Madison and Arizona whilst the tremors continued, until as soon as they had started, they suddenly stopped. A few screams were still heard from other buildings, and Arizona quickly asked Madison and Cherry if they were hurt, to which they replied that they were not, before creeping out from under the table. Just as Cherry crept out, one of the ceiling tiles fell and hit her hand, which made her shout in pain, but Madison quickly grabbed her and Arizona, before saying that they needed to leave this room, which was now apparently rather dangerous. Just as they tentatively grabbed their supplies and looked down the corridor, they noticed, to their confusion, that the lights within the corridor were unaffected and still functioning. Arizona then told the girls to wait, before heading over to apartment B8 and looking down the corridor to see that the living room was unaffected. He called over Madison and Cherry and they realised, to their surprise, that Game Maker Fling must have rigged the tremors to only occur directly beneath where each tribute had been during this time. They therefore entered apartment B8 and rested, but within a few minutes, another cannon sounded, and Arizona inconspicuously looked out the window to see that Bill had just finished battering Oasis from four with a chair leg. It was also seen by viewers that Tweet from three had been the first tribute to die during the tremors, when the electric equipment that she was trying to use in one of the recording studios had malfunctioned and given her a fatal electric shock, shortly followed by Lena from Five, who was hit on the back of the head by a falling roof beam. As Arizona watched Oasis's body being collected by the hovercraft, Madison tended to Cherry's bleeding hand. Arizona stated that there was not much else that they could do, and that they may as well keep watch from the window and the top of this block, which they proceeded to do for the rest of the day. When the sun set in the late evening, the trio took turns to keep watch and sleep, with the portraits of Tweet from three, Oasis from four, and Lena from five, shown at midnight, which left only seven tributes remaining. During the early hours of the next morning, most tributes were either fast asleep or trying not to fall asleep whilst they kept watch. Yet when the sun rose, Game Maker Fling made a very enthusiastic announcement, in which he instructed the happy campers to rise and shine, before going on to state that there would be a feast held in 30 minutes outside the entrance to the Jansen Mansion, at the top of the steps that led down to the main road of the complex. Cherry, who was keeping watch at the time, looked into the picnic basket whilst Arizona and Madison tried to wake themselves from their slumber, but they were subsequently awoken fully when Cherry announced that the food inside the picnic basket had gone mouldy. Arizona got up and looked inside, but he gagged with disgust when he smelt this food before slamming the basket shut. Madison then walked over to the sink to get some water, 
but just as she was about to sip from the tap, she noticed that the water was a pale shade of green, and Cherry quickly told her not to drink from it. Unbeknownst to tributes, Game Maker Fling had released a temporary poison into the air and water supply, which quickly produced a form of mouldy bacteria, and therefore made the food and water inedible, which would entice the tributes to attend the feast. The trio quickly realised that they would need to attend the feast, and they discussed how they should go about it. Arizona suggested that Cherry keep watch from the window of their apartment, as this gave them a decent view of the terrace below where the feast table would rise, but she adamantly refused, and stated that she wanted to help more directly, especially after what had happened to Junipero. Madison eventually agreed, and Arizona stated that he guessed there may be safety in numbers. When the half hour had almost gone by, the trio carefully made their way down the stairwell to the bottom of the B-block, before creeping across the grass and hiding behind a finely carved hedge by the left side of the bottom of the steps. They quietly whispered about when they should run up these steps, but just as Madison shushed the others when she thought she heard the feast table rising, Milka suddenly jumped out from behind the hedge on the opposite side before sprinting up these steps. The trio held their breath and tried to peek out from behind the wall, but just as Milka grabbed her bag, they heard her being hit with an arrow through the stomach, which was shot by Bill from the window of the dining room. As Milka fell to the ground, Bill let out a callous laugh, and Aris ran out from the hallway. Whilst Arizona and Madison proceeded to look at each other with worry, Cherry suddenly jumped out from behind the hedge, and she ran up the steps. Madison shouted at her to come back, but she paid no notice. Aurus was now busy trying to force a knife through Milka's neck, although she was using all her strength to stop him. This allowed Cherry to run forward and grab the bag for District 7. But just as Madison and Arizona reached the top of the steps, Bill shot another arrow, which hit Madison in the shoulder, and she shouted in pain as she fell to the ground. This alerted Aris' attention, and he quickly stabbed Milka in the neck with his knife before running back to Madison. Milka's cannon sounded, and Arizona tried to stop Aris as he charged towards Madison, but he punched Arizona, who also fell to the ground. Madison put out her hands, and Aris quickly crouched down by her, but just as he readied his knife, Cherry grabbed onto his arm. Aris shouted, and Cherry bit his ear, which made him scream in pain, and he stabbed Cherry in the chest, which caused her to fall back. Madison shouted and tried to get up, but Aris pushed her back down and tried to bring his knife down onto her. However, Arizona quickly ran back towards Milka's body, and he grabbed the arrow from her stomach. Just as Aris was about to stab Madison, Arizona ran back towards him and stabbed the arrow deep into the side of his neck. Aris immediately stopped moving and slowly rotated his neck to look at Arizona, who stabbed the arrow into his neck once more. Madison squealed at the sight of all the blood and grabbed the feast bag for District 6 before stumbling back up. She appeared to have noticed during this time that Bill had disappeared from the window, with viewers seeing that he had quickly been making his way down the eastern stairwell of the mansion towards the terrace. Madison then told Arizona to help her pick up Cherry, who seemed to be on the cusp of losing consciousness. As they carried Cherry down the steps, she spluttered blood from her mouth and Aurus's cannon sounded. The trio quickly made their way into the B block and practically crashed into apartment B1. Despite having her own painful wound, Madison rushed Cherry to the nearest bedroom and took off her black jacket before pushing it against Cherry's wound. She begged Arizona for help and asked him what she should do, although it soon emerged that he had a psychological issue with the sight of blood and he fainted within seconds. Madison panicked as Cherry's breathing slowed, but shortly before she died, Cherry mustered the strength to grab Madison's hand, and she said that she had wanted to help. As her breathing ceased, Madison cried and repeated to Cherry that she had saved her life. Arizona began to regain consciousness, and Cherry's cannon sounded moments later. Once the death claw had removed Cherry's body, Arizona and Madison made their way back up to apartment B8 before spending the afternoon resting, eating food, and drinking water from the feast bags. When the sun had set, Madison stated that with only four of them left, it was probably the last day tomorrow, and that only one of them had a chance of surviving. Arizona said that they should continue to work together until the end, and Madison said that she did not need to be convinced, 
before saying to Arizona that she was also sorry for him that he had to fight in these games and that he had been a good partner to her. The pair continued to keep watch and sleep after the sun had set, and at midnight, the portraits of Aris from one, Cherry from seven, and Milka from ten were shown, which did indeed leave only Proton from three, Arizona and Madison both from six, and Bill from ten remaining. Although Madison had agreed to take the second watch, Arizona struggled to fall asleep, and so he stayed awake for the rest of the night until the sun rose, and just as he said that there would probably be an announcement any second now, Game Maker Fling cheerfully addressed the tributes once again, congratulating them on making it to the final four, before stating that if they wanted to win, they would need to head to the Mansion Cinema, which he claimed was the only room in the house to be safe from a poisonous gas leak that was starting to enter the arena. Arizona swore loudly, and quickly rubbed his eyes whilst Madison grabbed the arrow that Arizona had taken from Milka's wound. The pair proceeded to speed down the stairwell and across the grass towards the steps by the terrace, whilst Arizona started to cough from what he stated were the effects of the gas, even though it was later revealed that it had not yet been released into the arena. Arizona and Madison seemed to be able to see Proton running ahead of them into the mansion's hallway, and they proceeded to follow him as he ran to his left along the main ground corridor and towards the cinema. Proton looked back as he heard the pair running along the corridor after him, but he realised that it was not a good idea to attack them, especially at this point, and so he continued through the doors and into the cinema, where viewers could see that Bill, who was now known as Butcher Bill to the capital audiences, was waiting for his remaining opponents. Just before Madison and Arizona were about to run into the cinema, Arizona stopped Madison from opening the door, and he once again said to her that he was sorry for choosing her in the reaping, to which Madison replied that she knew. They gave each other a bittersweet look, and Madison pulled the door open. The pair were immediately blasted with the sound that was coming from the huge screen that took up the entirety of the two-story wall in front of them. Even before observing the fight that was already occurring between Bill and Proton, they looked up through the darkness of the room to the screen, to see a dark-skinned male tribute with glasses, who was painfully holding a battery, while seven tributes in a lake in front of him were being electrocuted to death. They then saw that Bill was holding Proton against the screen, and smashing the chair leg over his head, before the action on the screen suddenly switched to show a tall and muscular male tribute, who was slashing a female tribute's neck with a scythe. Although they were somewhat in shock as the sounds of Proton's demise blended into the sounds of the televised kill behind them, Madison grabbed Arizona by the hand, and they charged straight towards Bill, whilst Proton slumped to the floor and his cannon sounded. Bill jolted around, and as Madison jumped through the air towards him, he hit her in the jaw with the chair leg, which knocked her to the ground, and she let out a scream of pain. As Arizona lunged forwards, he actually seemed to become slightly distracted by the sight of what appeared to be a human sloth on the screen behind Bill, strangling a female tribute with a silver chain. Arizona then punched Bill in the face, but Bill proceeded to headbutt him, and they sent him flying backwards to the floor. Bill grabbed the chair leg once again, and appeared to be aiming for Arizona's head, although he tripped on Proton's foot, and as he fell, he accidentally brought the chair leg down onto Arizona's neck whilst the screen quickly switched to show a smaller female tribute, bringing down an extremely sharp stalactite onto another female tribute's heart. Arizona started to choke from the impact on his neck, and he spluttered uncontrollably. Bill laughed and watched the screen, apparently mesmerised for a few seconds, before turning back to Madison, who was painfully trying to get up from the floor whilst holding her jaw. Bill grabbed the chair leg and approached Madison, but as he neared her, he was distracted by a red-headed female tribute lying slumped on the side of a desk before falling off the side. Bill appeared perplexed by what he was seeing, but just as he was getting ready to bring the chair leg down onto Madison, Arizona ran up behind him and tackled him from behind to the ground. When Bill fell, his head hit Madison's stomach and he shouted out in annoyance as Madison tried to get up from the floor. She gasped and held her stomach in pain as the screen behind her showed a tall male tribute, stabbing himself whilst a barely conscious female tribute lay next to him. Madison scarpered away from Bill, and after looking at her for a few seconds with almost no expression, he casually turned around 
and bashed the chair leg continually against Arizona's face before getting back up and turning towards Madison. But as he approached her, he suddenly fell to the floor and dropped the chair leg, which fell a few meters to his right. It was shown from a different angle that Arizona had somehow gathered the strength to grab onto Bill's leg, which had caused him to fall and the chair leg was now out of his reach. Bill fumed with anger as he tried to reach it, and he kicked out towards Arizona, who remarkably was able to maintain his grip. Arizona shouted at Madison to get on with it, and despite having been sat watching the screen in a state of shock, she quickly grabbed the arrow from one of her pockets and lunged towards Bill. It caught him in the heart, and as he screamed out, the screen showed a male tribute tearfully stabbing another male tribute in the stomach. Madison stabbed Bill with the arrow once more, and his breathing rapidly ceased, and Arizona seemed to realise that he was finally able to let go of Bill's leg. A cannon sounded, and Madison quickly scurried around to Arizona, whose breathing also seemed to be slowing. Madison grabbed onto Arizona's hand, and as the victor on the screen in front of them cried at the loss of his final opponent, she looked Arizona in the eye. She then told him that although she forgave him for choosing her, he had still tried to have her killed. Arizona's eyes widened in alarm, and Madison infamously muttered, Payback's a bitch, before plunging the arrow down through his heart. Madison noticed the screen suddenly switching to show her from the side, knelt over Arizona, and plunging the arrow through his black waistcoat into his heart. She looked up to the camera in an apparent state of shock, before her eyes looked straight back to the screen, with the arrow gripped firmly in her hand. The screen then switched once more, and Caesar Flickerman and Eugenia Ravenstill suddenly appeared, before announcing that Madison Hawker from District 6 was the victor of the 85th Hunger Games. She showed almost no reaction towards this announcement, and within a few seconds, she collapsed in exhaustion. Madison spent the next 48 hours in Ravenstill Hospital, where the capital kindly provided her with expert medical care, and by the end of her stay, she was once again in perfect health and ready for the victor's interview, where she wore a fabulous sparkling black dress. Throughout the game, she had become a rather popular victor amongst capital audiences for her ability to work with other tributes, along with her feisty attitude. Her relationship with Arizona was a main talking point throughout this interview, with Eugenia asking Madison if she had been tempted to kill him before the showdown, to which she replied that she had almost pushed him down the stairs as they fled the bloodbath on the first day, but that he had turned out to be more useful than expected in keeping her alive. Game maker Artulia Fling joined Eugenia and Madison after the main interview, and unsurprisingly, she was given a standing ovation for this epic quell. Madison was surprised to learn that it was Fling who had been making the announcements, to which he quickly fired back, well, who else did you think it would be? Which produced a laugh from the audience, although Madison did not seem particularly amused by this comment. Former game maker Penelope Paddock also came to the stage for this interview, and she congratulated Fling on these games, whilst commending her personal approach as a game maker, and stating that she wished she could have had the same amount of fun as Fling had clearly had when making these games. Fling replied to Paddock that her former mentor, Mortimer Wimsywick, had said to her on her first day of work during the 81st games that, if you find a job you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Following these games, Madison returned to District 6. She spent most of the next few months in the Morfling Dens, and proceeded to become rather wealthy from her dealings with the customers that visited these parts. After being the mentor of District 6 for several years, Madison began to spend a lot of her time in District 14, where she set up her own factory that produced and packaged leeks for the capital's consumption.